But first, my brain dump. Nursing care homes are supposed to be a sanctuary to our most cherished and elderly loved ones so they can live out their lives in comfort, safety and dignity. At the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, the leaders responsible for protecting that comfort, safety and dignity repeatedly told us things like this. Right from the start, we've tried to throw a protective ring around our care homes. We'll keep working to strengthen the protective ring that we've cast around all our care homes. Well, we absolutely did uh, throw a protective ring around social care. That was Britain's health secretary, Matt Hancock, at the time, but that was a lie. There was no protective ring. In fact, there was a complete opposite, a deadly decision-making fiasco that removed protection from nursing homes and turned them into human slaughterhouses. In a monumentally stupid policy, tens of thousands of elderly patients were sent from hospitals back to their homes without being tested to see if they had the killer virus that wrought its worst damage on the elderly. COVID spread through those nursing homes like wildfire, causing countless more deaths than should have ever been allowed to happen. The same thing happened in New York, where the shamed former governor, Andrew Cuomo, once lauded as a cool-headed hero of the pandemic, not only did this too, but then lied about the number of people who died. In the UK, up to 30,000 people are feared to have died in nursing homes, partly because of this negligence. They weren't even asked to isolate when they got back to those homes from hospitals having not been tested. Just think about that. No testing, no isolation. And this wasn't a tragic accident. This was deliberate government policy. Now the UK's High Court has today ruled that the policy broke the law. So Boris Johnson's government, already reeling from the Partygate scandal, which saw him personally fined, is facing further charges of behaving like common criminals during the crisis. Disgraced former Health Secretary Matt Hancock, who resigned from breaking lockdown rules himself that he'd helped to make, said ministers have been absolved. They haven't. They got it horribly, tragically wrong. And they can't say they weren't warned by people at the time. When the Health Secretary and Prime Minister keep claiming that they put a protective ring around our care homes, that is just a complete lie, isn't it? Because if they had, okay. you wouldn't have 30,000 people residents dying and you wouldn't have 469 social care workers dying. That's not a protective ring. We have really stepped up uh, to support care homes, support local authorities and support... They didn't step up. And it's all a lie, as has now been proven in the High Court. At the time, Boris Johnson tried to even blame nursing home staff for not following protocols. But they did follow protocols. It was the protocols laid down by the government that cost an untold number of lives, including many of the selfless and heroic staff that Boris Johnson tried to blame. Today, Johnson did what he always does. He said it wasn't his fault. Uh, is the thing that we didn't know in particular, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, was uh, that COVID could be transmitted asymptomatically yes. in, in the way that it was. And, uh, and that was something that I, that I wish we had known more about uh, at the time. He didn't know. That's what he always says, isn't it? Didn't know about the parties, didn't know about asymptomatic transmission. It, but is that true, Prime Minister? It's not, is it? Because your own chief scientific advisor, speaking in March 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic, said this. It looks quite likely that there is, uh, is some degree of asymptomatic transmission. There's definitely quite a lot of transmission very early in the disease when there are very mild symptoms. That's the government's chief scientific advisor in March 2020. So you knew Boris Johnson. You knew. Once again, he's refusing to face up to his own mistakes. In this case, they're horrifying consequences. He and his government didn't just fail our elderly. They killed them. Their terrible policy let COVID rip through nursing homes, and that led to thousands of unnecessary deaths. There will be many terrible legacies from this pandemic. But this one may be the most shameful and avoidable. And from incompetence in government to indecency, the deputy leader of the British Opposition Party has been smeared in a nasty, sexist, anonymous newspaper briefing, suggesting she deliberately crosses and uncrosses her legs to distract Boris Johnson in the House of Commons. An unnamed Conservative MP accused Angela Rayner of a ploy to put the Prime Minister off his stride, evoking the famous scene involving Sharon Stone in the movie Basic Instinct. The MP told the man on Sunday she knows she can't compete with Boris's Oxford Union debating training, but she has other skills which he lacks. 
for God's sake. Well, first of all, you don't need to flash a pair of hot legs to get one over Boris Johnson in Parliament. Given how poorly he's performing at the moment, a barely functioning brain will suffice. Secondly, Angela Rain is a very smart, very feisty cookie who deserves a lot better than this pathetic, misogynistic nonsense, as do all female politicians. But it's what happened next that causes me even more concern. Because the Speaker of the House of Commons, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, summons the editor of the Mail on Sunday to discuss the story because he found it offensive. An absurd command which the newspaper rightly rejected. It's not the paper that's at fault here. It's the repellent MP who made the slur in the first place. Speaker Hoyle should get back in his box, focus on finding out who this malevolent miscreant MP was, and then discipline him for abusing parliamentary standards of conduct. He should leave the free press to do their jobs without such unacceptable political interference, even if it occasionally offends him. In fact, now I think about it, particularly if it occasionally offends him. Police have released sensational footage of the events before, during, after the appalling shooting of a young female cinematographer on a low-budget western in the Santa Fe desert. The death of Helena Hutchins on the set of Joel D'Souza's Rust is one of the most appalling tragedies in Hollywood history. I don't doubt for a moment it was an accident. Nobody deliberately killed her. But she died, leaving a grief-stricken husband and young child. And the person who was holding the gun that killed her was the movie star Alec Baldwin. In the new footage, Baldwin can be seen pointing the gun around on set and then later reacting with horror when he's told that Hutchins has died. I do have some very unfortunate news to tell you. Um, she didn't make it. I'm sure he felt terrible. We all would in that position. But if you've been following this story for the past six months, as I have, you might be forgiven for thinking Alec Baldwin was the real victim here. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you to all of the people who sent me such kind words and, uh, you know, best wishes and strength and hope and prayers and so forth and thoughts and lots of encouragement. Oh, good for you. I'm glad you're being encouraged. That's like a humble brag Oscar acceptance speech, isn't it? Baldwin's self-pity PR tool has been a deeply unedifying, self-centred and pretty ghastly attempt to save his career. He insists this tragedy had nothing to do with him, that he was in no way responsible for that gun firing and killing Helena Hutchins. But for all his bluster, the story is far from over. And frankly, the idea that it's got nothing to do with Baldwin is patently absurd. He held the gun that fired the bullet that killed this young woman. The Hollywood Actors Union is pretty clear about this. Actors should always check guns to ensure they don't have real bullets. And in this case, they could have used a fake rubber gun on the set of Rust. That's always the safest option. Police have now revealed text messages sent by Rust prop master Sarah Zachary, which suggest it was Baldwin himself who always wanted to take risks. Alec never liked anything fake like guns and even the rubber knife, she said. He always wanted the real knife. He always wanted his real gun. Baldwin's failure to take any personal responsibility for this horrific incident is shameful. He has a lot of questions left to answer. And I suggest the only talking he now does is not on Instagram, but to the police. Well, staying with Tinseltown's most terrible, it's the world's most gruesome twosome in the bile of the century. Those supreme narcissists, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, all of each other in court again, trading vicious, ugly claim and counterclaim over who was more abusive to the other one. And with a war raging, a pandemic still going, and the inflation soaring, the spectacle of this pair of deluded, self-obsessed thespians once again acting up their marriage drama for public delectation makes me vomit. But there is one positive thing out of all this that did catch my eye. Crowds of Depp's fans have gathered outside court to support the embattled star. They're apparently called the Deppsters. And one of them has brought along two emotional support alpacas. She told reporters she hoped it would calm Johnny down and brighten his day. Now, it's not clear if Depp even knows they're there, these alpacas, but I did a bit of research, and I said to my team, you know, we should get into this story. And you know what? They came good, because I turned up today, and I discovered that after my stressful week launching Piers Morgan Uncensored, when I'm feeling tense and need to calm and just relax and chill, I've got my own alpacas. Not from the Deppsters, but from... Jess, who's brought them for me. Jess, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Introduce me. This is Margarita. 
This is Margarita, and the uh, one that's sitting down is Tess. And I'm told Margarita's a bit more friendly, is that right? Yeah, she's the friendly one. Can I, can I stroke? Give her a stroke on the back of the neck. Hi, hi Margarita. <laughs> I do love a nice Margarita, I have to say. <laughs> um, and, and they can bring me calm and Hopefully. soothe my, my nerves, my tension. Yeah, so just being around alpacas, I think, gives you something to focus on. So it sort of takes you away mentally from whatever you're feeling in your head. Um, I, can, I can actually start I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> and they can actually encourage leadership skills, I yeah, hear, right? I think so, because they sort of, well, you have to lead them around a field one way or another. Yeah. So you have to sort of take charge, otherwise they'll take you for a So week. they can cure my <laughs> anxiety, my stress, my tension. They can teach me how to lead a group of people. Yeah. They sound perfect <laughs> for Piers Morgan Uncensored. Are they disagreeable, bad-tempered? Um, they don't get no, enough sleep? they're just stubborn. Uh, <laughs> the one is on the floor. <laughs> stubborn. To get up. It sounds even more perfect. I love their signs. <laughs> Here's Morgan Uncensored. And I can quite see now, having been in the presence of these wonderful animals, why Johnny Depp may be, may be getting some comfort from just being around alpacas. What wonderful animals they are. <laughs>